Welcome to Your Family Dog, a podcast dedicated to helping families love living with dogs. Hi, and welcome, welcome back to Your Family Dog. Uh, I'm Julie Fudge-Smith, and I'm here with Tina Spring, and we're delighted to be back recording new episodes after our summer hiatus. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about dog parks and shy dogs. But first, we thought maybe y'all would like y'all, because I used to live in the South. I don't live in the South anymore, but I used to live in the South, so I get to say y'all on occasion. Um, What's even better is if you can say all y'all. That's my favorite. But... um, what we thought we would do is do a little bit of an update about what we did this summer. Um, not that I'm going to write an essay on it, but just a little bit of uh, uh, where we're at right now. And um, so, Tina, is there anything exciting or new you'd like to talk about that happened to you this summer? So, um, let's see. We were we were given the Doberman. So, that's having a horse in the house has been a bit of an, an adventure. Um, and I actually took up a new exercise, a, a couple of new exercise programs that have, oddly enough, resulted in me liking exercise, which is not something I have historically ever done. Um, and I'm currently the walking wounded. Um, <laughs> Julie knows I've managed to either pull an oblique or um, fracture a rib. So our our crack editing team will probably be editing out a certain amount of owls if I start laughing or, or if I cough or sneeze. So, so that's been super fun and exciting. Um, but overall, I kind of recalibrated my ca- my calendar to be a calendar and a schedule that reflects as if I was doing it for someone I liked. So instead of it being a calendar that appeared to be murderous of me, I kind of recalibrated things and said, you know what, I'm one person and this is silly and I am I cannot continue to um, effectively and kindly and empathetically serve the world if I am working this much. So I I took the summer to really go, okay, there needs to be a little bit more me and a little bit less of all the shenanigans. And it's I think I'm serving customers better, um, maybe not as many customers, but better, and definitely serving me better. So, what about you? Well, I think those are all very exciting news stories. Um, I we should hear what is the Doberman's name? That's first of all my question. Oh, so his name is Dovi, D-O-V-I. Dovi. Though, though the big goofball probably thinks his name is Dovi because he doesn't really listen. He's about a 20 month old intact male singleton litter so that brings with it trials and tribulations yeah that's some really interesting issues with singletons yes um and he i mean he is has a sweet and kind heart but no tolerance for frustration not a ton of impulse control and of course he's an intact baby boy doberman so there's a lot of you're not the boss of me <laughs> so so he does what I ask, but he yells at me about it, rah, 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 like lots of barking at me and telling me I'm doing it wrong. Um, but he is also, um, well, we jokingly just call him Clip Clop because it's like having a horse in the house. Like he's just, he's a big doofus. He's very charming. He's very kind. He's everything a Doberman Pinscher is supposed to be, which I love. My parents started breeding and showing Doberman Pinschers in 1979. So this is a breed that holds pieces of my heart. So it's exciting. And I had forgotten what it was like to have a stable dog in the house. So he's not easy because he's a giant adolescent fool who, you know, it, it, I'm trying to to train and raise him kind of green at a really difficult developmental time to go, no, I am your new mom and I am the boss of you a little bit. Um, and so he's like, ah, whatever, I'm going to do my own thing and be a big doofus. But he he's also pretty magical and doesn't really get his feathers ruffled about much. 
Which is really nice because since you have other very sensitive dogs in your household, to have someone who doesn't get its feathers ruffled is just it's like, thank you. I, I, one less animal I have to worry about during a kerfuffle is really lovely to have. Yes. And he does, I will say, like when the adult dogs are like, seriously, dude, knock it off like you're too much. He's really good at going, oh, my bad. And then immediately forgetting that they told him to stop. But he doesn't like he doesn't get I mean, he's a big doofusy boy. Right. So he and if it was a girl, it would be a princess. Right. Like he has a little bit of like, I'm a big dog and I I want to play and I want everyone to be my friend. He, he's just enormous. Right. And so our house is not really designed for an enormous dog and he doesn't have a lot of house manners. So we're working on that and difficult to do when I have some pretty significant trunk pain. Cause it turns out you use those obliques a lot more than you'd think. Yes, I know. Whenever, um, you know, my trainer has me do a lot of obliques. I was just like, Oh my goodness. Um, I thought I knew that I had obliques, but wow. Um, yeah, no. And, and I have had a broken rib. In fact, I had three broken ribs from falling off one of my horses. Yeah, it's it's painful. Breathing was just not my friend anymore. Yeah, sleeping. Like accidentally rolling over in the middle of the night will light you up. Oh, yeah. And, and whatever you do, don't start telling me any jokes because that's just a killer. Right. Oh, no, I, I you have a great deal of sympathy for me. What I will tell you is that it really does heal completely. It's one of those things that had oh, no good. residual. Once it healed, there was no residual effects. Not like. Not like when I broke my tailbone that now, 20 years later, I still have to be careful how I no, sit down. Your ribs will be fine. Your ribs will be fine. Excellent. Well, that's good yeah. news. I'll be back boxing in no time. <sighs> so, yeah. So I'm totally digging my new workout routine and, and um, I'm kind of grouchy right now that I don't get to do it for a couple of weeks at least. And and the, my chiropractor, my doctor was like, well, you can walk. She's like, just know that your body will hit a wall where it goes, yeah, you're not doing that anymore and you might need to stand still and call Christopher and have him come pick you up in the car because to continue will be excruciating and yeah we that was not very that was not a very long walk yesterday so I'm I am stubborn if nothing else um and so having I'm getting I'm practicing listening to my body isn't that <laughs> way fun that I I do not typically have to do that. And when she told me like the, cause she really suspects I fractured a rib. I was like, you're kidding. Like there was no contact. Nobody hit me. And she goes, no, you don't under, like you can sneeze and break a rib. She's like, we're of an age now. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, well, uh, let's see. Uh, we did a lot of traveling this summer. We got to, um, my husband came to me yesterday and said, Julie, we should have gone to Europe this summer because the dollar is really strong against European currencies, against the euro as well as against the pound. And we happened to take a driving tour to the Western United States at the peak of the gas prices. So yay for us. Um, we went to Yellowstone and Grand Tetons and we left Yellowstone the day that the rain started. It was on our schedule to leave. So we were very fortunate we got out of there before they closed Yellowstone. And we were very grateful that that uh, no one was was killed because there could have been an awful lot of problems with what the damage that was done to Yellowstone. But anyway, that was uh, at the peak of the um, gas prices. And that's when we decided to take a driving trip. So yay for us. Well, that's super. Fun. It was super fun. Although I, I am um, I'm pretty jealous. Like that's not a trip that I've done yet and one that's definitely on the bucket list. So. Yeah, um, it was it was wonderful. And we went in through the Lamar Valley and saw wolf packs. And I mean, I was almost in tears. I was so excited to see the wolves. And anyway, it was a great trip. And uh, we also got to visit some friends on the way. And that was good. And then we spent basically the month of July, most of the month of July at our cottage, having family and friends come out and visit us. And then in August, we did a four day, well, we went up and visited my brother and his wife at their cottage on Lake Coeur d'Alene. And then my brother joined Brad and I, and we went backpacking and fly fishing in the Ootenay Mountains of Utah. 
for four days, three nights. And the best part, the very best part, Tina, was our guide brought his dog with him. Adele is a, a German long-haired pointer and a hunting dog for him. Fabulous dog, just top-notch. I just fell in love with her. She, I, at one point, Adele got a couple of small seeds in her eyes that were maybe, you know, like an eighth, a quarter of an inch. And they were caught in the corner of her eye. This dog is so good. He held her very gently and held her eye open. And I took a pair of very, very fine tweezers and plucked the seeds out. And she didn't flinch. Now, Zuzu. Zuzu would have impaled both eyes on the tweezers and maybe one of yours, too. Right. Um, no, we would never try tweezers. It would have been an eye wash, if anything, with Zuzu. But it probably would have been, we need to go to the vet and be anesthetized, or, you know, just to be sedated so that we can use even an eye wash. So I was so impressed just with the quality of the dog and how the husbandry skills were just obviously very good. Funny, it makes me think like, oh, I need to make a Dovey list. Because, you know, when you get a new dog, there's a little bit of where do we begin? And arguably his list is long enough that I have a lot of things on that list. So I need to just begin. Right. I was going to say, uh, Zazie did a great blog on prioritizing your training goals with a new dog so that you know what you want to achieve. And I thought that's a really great idea is make a list of your goals and then prioritize them because you're much more likely to succeed if you've got a priority in a goal setting. Yeah. But the one thing I will say that this trip did for me is I came back and I started cooperative care. Nice. It'd been sitting on my shelf and I've been, you know, meaning to do it, meaning to do it. And I went, you know what? Realizing what my dogs couldn't do. Right. Has really propelled me to move towards starting cooperative well, care. Well, and I don't know if people are aware of this. We'll have to see if Deb if um, Dr. Jones wants to come on and visit with us, but you can actually do earn titles in cooperative care. That is so cool. Via video. So for the people, not me, but for the people who really enjoy earning those merit based, like we've passed competency on certain skills, they can actually um, title their dog in cooperative care, which is fantastic. You know, this is probably the same people that all earned all the badges, like in Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. Okay, so, so remember I talked about how I hate exercise? I earned two medals doing my workouts. Right, like I would have, okay, so if somebody had told me, like, hey, you're going to be one of these people who does these big challenges, I would have been like, you need to you know, lay off the pharmaceuticals or something. And I'm enjoying the working out so much that I actually have added that to, to what I'm doing. So. Well, good for you. I know. Good I was, for you. Well, it's, it's, I feel the same way. If somebody had told me a couple of years ago that I'd be doing powerlifting at, in, the, my, in my 60s, I'd be like, are you insane? But I love it. I absolutely love powerlifting. So, I mean, you got to try stuff. I, like I tried fencing when we lived in Princeton, you know, it didn't take just, I thought I would love fencing and I didn't. So, uh, you never know until you try. All right. So this episode, I wait a minute, Tina, I've got one more great big announcement, what, oh, big announcement, oh, which I haven't okay, even told you. Oh my God. I have a publisher for my book. Yay. Congratulations. So I can't give any more details because I haven't signed the final contract, but stay tuned, people. I have a contract for my book. And at this rate, what we're hoping for, we're aiming for uh, an early summer distribution. I'm so excited. I wonder if you'll come on the show and talk about it. I, I don't know. You'll have to, like, you know, book my agent. But, um, okay. yeah, I think I might. But anyway, so stay tuned, folks, and for more information on the Beast Keepers. Anyway, so with that, let's go to what we claim here to talk about, which are dog parks are not, as Susan Clothier says, in the Forever Dog, which we highly, highly recommend. We'll yeah. give you a link to that. It's a great book. There are so many chapters. I mean, I feel like we could spend three years just discussing the Forever Dog. Yes. But one of the things I put three exclamation points next to this sentence in the book Dog parks are the worst choice for under-socialized or shy dogs. I couldn't agree with her more, hence the three exclamation points. She goes on to say, if you want to create positive outdoor experiences for a reactive or fearful dog, 
you'll have to commit the time it takes to repattern your dog's behavior at a pace and with training techniques that don't stress him out. Research is clear that punishment-based training exacerbates, how about exaggerates, anxiety and further increases stress hormones. So, Tina, what do you have to say about shy dogs and dog parks? I mean, I think generally dog parks are a really awful choice here in the States. I agree. And in Canada. And my heart breaks to say that. Yes. Because it's something that the idea of it is not necessarily awful, but I see far more damage than I see blessing coming from it. I would agree with you 100% on that one. One of my staff got to go to Ireland. Uh, after she earned her PhD this year, it was her like her big celebration trip. And she texted me from Ireland specifically about dogs and said, it's the weirdest thing here. Like people's dogs do not solicit attention from other people or from other dogs. And she went to a dog park and was mesmerized that all these dogs are at the dog park and they're not playing with each other. They're playing with their owners. So the dogs don't go play with someone else's dog. They're engaged with the person, the people that they live with. And my experience is that the idea of dog parks actually came from that European model. So multiple blind entries. So dogs aren't standing at a gate waiting to tackle the dog coming in. That there's a marshal there who's helping to navigate Um, vaccine requirements and health, both behaviorally and physically, um, age-wise, and and that the dogs pay attention to their handlers, not to everything else. So it's a very different thing than what we experience here in the States. And yeah, like if I wanted to go film aggression and awful social interaction, my heart breaks to say this, I would just go to the local dog park. I agree. It's terrible. I, this last week, a friend of mine, we, we meet up every Thursday and walk our dogs together. And it's worked out really well. We've gone to some areas that have, you know, don't have a lot of dogs. And, uh, but she said, I'd like to go to the dog park this week because we're doing a lot of camping and we're running into this kind of thing and I want my dogs to be comfortable with it. So I said, okay, it's a Thursday morning at 10 a.m. So we're less likely to have you know, a lot of dogs there. But I'll tell you, my very first rule of the dog park, is we don't go in the dog park. I walk the perimeter of the dog park or I stand outside and I watch the dogs in the dog park for a long time before I even consider whether or not this is a safe place for my dogs to be. And I think it was really interesting because we were standing there and this greyhound came from one end of the dog park. And the one they have here is huge. So it really allows people to have a lot of room to spread out and walk their dogs. Not that they do that, but you have the ability to. And this greyhound came tearing up to the fence and I went, well, we may or may not be going in. And then when it got to the fence, it was all wiggly and happily to see my dog. And we ended up going in and and it turned out to be okay. But it was the, I was um, not excited about going to the dog park. And also very willing to say after watching the dogs, depending, and that was, she was the only dog in the park. So because we had this, and so when I went into the, what I call the airlock, right? And the Greyhound was on the other side. I spent a long time in there having the dogs talk to each other through the fence. And when everybody seemed to relax, that's when we went into the dog park and and everything was fine. But I went with the knowledge that we very well may not be going into the dog park because I won't go in unless I'm completely convinced that my dogs will come up behaviorally sound. That was the key for me, is my dogs have to come up behaviorally sound. Right. So when we think about the shy or fearful dog, right, or the reactive dog, being rushed at the gate, even by an overly zealous, happy dog, is really, really scary. It would be scary for you, too. Yes, absolutely. I don't want dogs running up to me even if they're friendly, it doesn't feel safe. No, it really doesn't. It doesn't. So we don't know vaccination or health for any dog that's ever been there. So we don't know what, you know, diseases are picking up out of the mass water bowl or the, or the soil right here in Georgia, we're stuck. The environment never gets cool enough to kill off Parvo. It's not like Ohio that becomes a frozen tundra. (laughs) Enjoy that. Yeah, I will. But in addition, 
I would say that we're not as good at keeping our dogs focused on us, right? I would agree. So I'll, I'll use the Doberman as an example because he's learning some new manners, right? Some people are put off by a Doberman. You do not need to be afraid of this one. He's a fool. But some people are worried about a big Doberman pincher. So when we're walking, if someone's coming toward us, Dovi and I move off the path you know, the sidewalk, the street, whatever, we hang out, we quietly watch whatever that is go by, say hello to everyone. Like he doesn't get to go say hello to everyone. And then we rejoin our walk. If I took him, which I'm not going to do, but if I took him to the dog park, I would be responsible to call my dog away from the airlock, as you called it, so that your dog gets to come in and like get released and move and settle before clip clop goes racing over to say hello and listen, you know, give a big playback. I agree. I agree. And that's one of my biggest reasons why I don't go to dog parks is because owners don't call their dogs away from the entrance. And so you get there and your dog's on one side of the entrance and they can be up to like five or six dogs on the other side. And when it's that case, I won't go in. And that is certainly something you don't want to subject a shy dog to. It's one thing to have a, you know, sort of a, an emotionally stable, normal, I'm doing normal in air quotes here, dog experience a crowd. But if you have a shy or reticent dog, this dog is going to be overwhelmed and traumatized by the very exuberance of this crowd, no matter how friendly it is. And if you have an aroused dog, you're just going to amp it up beyond belief that may amp it up into aggression. To be honest, I think this is where anthropomorphizing helps. Yes. You wouldn't do it to a shy child. You wouldn't take a shy child to a rave, right? They're going to be overstimulated. You would not take a sensitive child to these environments. It's not kind, right? So if I use a dog park, this is how I use it. We're outside the fence. We're on the, the side that no one ever approaches. The dog and I hang out and we eat string cheese together while watching what's going on in the dog park. Yep. And I'm monitoring, okay, if person A calls their dog, does their dog come when called? Like, I'm watching behavior. Are the dogs responding to their owners at all? Like, do, have they forgotten their names, right? Yes. Are they using good social skills with the other dogs? If dog a says hey i'm getting tired i'm just gonna lay here in the sun is dog b barking at them and play bowing and tackling them and jumping over them and trying to instigate play even though dog a is politely declining or is dog b going and finding somebody else who wants to play right are they are the dogs checking in with their handlers can i tell which dog goes with which person right or is it, or have the dogs decided like no the humans are you know, we're just going to ignore them. We're going to go out here and hunt webbits, right? So I, I'm evaluating a whole bunch of things the same way that I would be evaluating whether or not my child should play in a play group. Are they using good social skills or are they punching each other in the face? And no dog, I don't care. I don't care what breed you have. I do not think that there is any breed of dog who wants to spend an hour playing at the dog park. At that point, their brain is just running around like their brain's been asleep 20 minutes and their body's just tackling stuff like they're so tired that they're not going to make great decisions. Right. And I think that that's one of the biggest mistakes that people st do is they spend way too much time at the dog park. And one of the things that they'll do is if there's a group of people is that the people will all sit at the picnic table and talk and pay absolutely no attention to what's going on with the dogs. And then the dogs start circling them. Or on their phone. Yeah, yeah. And so they're paying absolutely no attention. And then occasionally it's the, oh, Beavis, stop. Beavis, stop. Beavis, stop. Right, because there's, you know, a hump fest going on over in the corner. So, yeah, if I'm at the dog park, I'm literally walking the perimeter consistently. I am randomly calling my dog, telling him what a good boy he is, and then sending him to go play. Right. Right? I'm monitoring can I call you out of play? If I can't call you out of play, I need to interrupt you and put you back on a leash. Right. And I do the same thing when we go in with the dogs. I don't stop moving because if I'm moving and walking, my dogs are moving and walking with me. 
and it makes it much easier for them to then focus on me, not focus on the crowd that's going on over there. We practice calls and comes, and um, I will carry like five or six tennis balls because I know that I can always throw a tennis ball to get my dogs to move. And if somebody else takes a tennis ball, doesn't matter. Mommy's got another one. Well, as long as that other dog is in a resource garter. Right. Because if you threw that tennis ball and Mr. was in the play group, which I love you enough not to do, like then we have a little furry velociraptor with a tennis ball. Right. Who's threatening to murder in a most vile manner anyone who looks at his tennis ball. So that, by the way, was not his. It was stolen like a pirate. <laughs> so, so yeah, like I will say if I can ignore the disease stuff, which is difficult for me. My community does have some private paddocks where you pay a dollar a dog for an hour and your dog can play in an airlock environment. You literally have a key to a lock on the gate. And if you have, if, for example, my dogs were social with other dogs. So Dovey, for example, has a couple of my staff dogs that he really likes. We could totally and completely, if we wanted to ignore the disease part, go and let the boys play at the dog park or do training at the dog park because it's a private paddock. But even then, we're going to come in 10 minutes after the time. It's it's rented on the hour. So I wouldn't even try to pick up a key until 110. And I would return it at 150 so that my dog is not either being run headlong into a dog who's exhausted and aroused coming out of the dog park or a dog who's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs that they're getting to go into the paddock. I want to turn everything into security at the gate, not at the gate of the dog park. Right. And then if you think about it, you still have 40 minutes for your dogs to play. And that is more than enough. The dogs don't want to do it that long. Right. The one thing I'll say about the dog park here is that it has three paddocks, one huge one for big dogs a really good size one for small dogs and then a private one where I have taken clients who want to work outside and be able to do some off lead training with their dog in an enclosed area. And we've worked in that pet private one. And when somebody's tried to come in, all they need to say is, Hey, we're training here. We'll be done in 15 minutes or whatever it is. So they did design it very nicely. The problem is, is that everybody thinks that their dog is more social than what it actually is. Or they mistake arousal for friendliness. Yes. And I think that's a huge mistake. And I also think, too, that dog parks are used mistakenly for, quote unquote, socialization. I have an under-socialized shy dog, so maybe I should take him to the dog park where he can freely move with the other dogs and play and get used to the idea, but still have room to move away. Doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. They get bullied. They do. They get bullied and then they escalate. And so then you get a reactive dog. And then if you keep going, then you get an aggressive dog. Right? It it does the opposite of what we think is going to happen. And frankly, if you have a socially savvy dog, they're not going to want to go. Like they're going to lock it up and go, I'm not going in there. It's like, it's nutty in there. It doesn't feel safe, right? Because that's not how dog social systems work. They're not just random dogs showing up and like immediately wrestling and chasing and play fighting. That is not normal dog interaction. No, it's not. Dogs like people are family based. And yeah, so. And you don't play all the time. Yeah. Well, I'm looking at Zuzu and Clemmy right now, and they're both, Zuzu's sacked out on my feet, and Clemmy's sacked out in the hallway so she can watch, you know, I've got multiple angles going on here. So right. something should happen. I'm going to be the first to be aware. So let's talk about what you do if you do have that shy reactive dog. Good idea. Because I am absolutely crystal clear that all those people taking their shy reactive dog to the dog park are doing it with the best of intent. Yes. They are trying to help their dog. So one socialization is not touching. Socialization is watching. So you work at a distance large enough that your dog in 10 minutes could fall asleep in the sun. That's a pretty big distance typically, right? So dog is on a loose leash, no leash pressure at all. I take a big blanket like we're going on a picnic 
and we chill out and we watch the world go by at a pretty substantial distance. Right. And the other thing that I include in that, and I'm sure you probably do too, and you're going to go to it, is snacks. Snacks are happening. Sure. You know? Not snacks for doing or not doing something. Just random snackage. Right. Just the snack fairy. One of the reasons why I like to do that is because it helps me to gauge the dog's emotional response. Yeah. Because if you're taking snacks, if you're relaxed and we're just having a little bit of cheese here and we're taking snacks, I can tell immediately when your emotional stability is starting to change. If you start either, either you stop taking snacks, something's happened, it's too close, we need more distance, or two, you start taking it kind of like a shark, you're telling me you're getting stressed. And so we are only there as long as everybody's happy and relaxed because the whole purpose here is not to arouse you. The whole purpose right. here is to help you understand that the world is kind of safe and you're okay. A little bit of stress and resolve and a little bit of stress and resolve. And how I know when I can get closer is that my dog starts noticing other dogs and gently wagging their tail. They're not holding their breath. They're not whining. They're not growling, certainly. They're not barking. They're not staring at that other dog. They're not leaning backward. They're not, they don't have a wrinkly forehead. They're just watching. They're like, oh, look, there's a dog over there. A couple other things to look for. Sometimes like the dog's got an open mouth and panting. The mouth is closed. The lips get kind of tight. They'll start lip licking. The other thing is, as I find, is the dog, not only, you're right, leans back, but may move behind me. That's a really super absolute positive cue. Things are getting overwhelming. But I think it's really important. We've talked about dog body language a lot. You need to understand what your dog's stress signals are. And when you see them begin to accumulate, you beginning to understand that it's becoming a little bit more difficult for your dog. But you're right. When the dog sees another dog and doesn't respond with any kind of stress signals, you know you're on the right track. So yeah, there's just a little bit of having my dog learn to go, there's a dog that's not some, or person, that's not something I need to worry about. I can just watch that. What happens over time is you start seeing soft tail wags. Yes. You start to see a dog who picks their head up and goes, yep, there's a dog, and then goes back to sleep, cuddled up against your leg, right, in the sun. Then we're like, okay, now maybe we can go to somewhere that there's a little bit more activity or we're a tad bit closer. Mm -hmm. Having careful, soft exposures eventually to stable dogs I know. And that, again, does not mean that we take everybody off leash and go here, go play. We might sit and each do some soft obedience with our dog together. Not because we're doing obedience training. The dogs are just working in an in an approximate space together. Like, can you stay in connection with me even though Zuzu is over there and she's very pretty? Right. The other thing I find, too, is that when I'm doing that, when I, for example, Zuzu's my, Zuzu and Clemmy, I will oftentimes take if I've got a, a reactive dog and I can get them to focus on me. So if my dog is focused on me taking treats and paying no attention to the shy or reactive dog or whatever, it allows the shy or reactive dog to take a breath and maybe come a little bit closer because my dog is not doing anything that is threatening to that dog because I'm not looking at it. I'm not, you know, leaning towards it, you know, whatever. One of the things that I've done when I was doing puppy classes is if I had a shy puppy and my, my puppy classes were never more than six, usually somewhere between five to six puppies is if I had a shy one, all the other puppies were on leashes and it was the shy one when it came time to play that I would let off lead and whoever that puppy picked to play with, I would give them their separate area to play with for a few minutes. So allowing the shy dog to make a decision who it is that I want to play with, respecting that, but not allowing it to get overwhelming for that puppy. So I think that's the other thing to remember is what we're talking about. We're not talking about you taking your dog and the blanket and being out there for five hours in the sun watching the world. I, you know, these can be short, meaningful sessions. And I think one of the things we need to remember is that, and she talks about this in cooperative care, is that short increments are going to pay off for you more than trying to do a whole hour at a time. You know, five, ten minutes at a time 
and your dog's comfortable and happy, that's going to have much more long-term rewards than if you push it to the point where the dog says, I can't do this anymore. Even at this distance, I can't do this anymore. We're trying to build resilience. Yes, absolutely. So so I'm going to use an exercise analogy, right? The coaches on the exercise program I'm using are saying you're creating teeny tiny little tears that heal very, 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 very quickly. They resolve very quickly. That builds muscle mass, right? So it's not what I did where I've just significantly injured my stubborn self, right? Because now I can't do that for a period of time because I took too big a bite of the apple right? I worked too hard, too intensely, too quickly and hurt myself. So now I have to sit on the bench for a bunch of time and let it heal. I would say that that is a really good analogy for behavior and life experience. It's not about obedience for the dog who's worried about other dogs or other people. It's not about obedience. It's about behavior and learning how to navigate the world. So we want thousands of tiny little experiences that nothing really dramatic happens. The dog goes, I can handle this. I can handle this. I can do that again. Oh, I could do that again. Oh, I'm good at this. I'm good at this. I can watch that dog from over there. And, and, and that feels good to me. I get a little dopamine hit. And what dopamine does is it helps the body anticipate pleasurable sensations. That's what dopamine does. We want a lot of dopamine. We want experience front-loaded to be a positive experience, that the dog is craving and anticipating a positive experience so that they're ready to have a positive experience. When we build on a really fragile system where the dog is really concerned about what's going to happen, it's too much, too fast, I can't make it stop, I get overwhelmed is the dopamine will just dump out of the system and then you're left with fight or flight, which is how we get reactive dogs. Right. And that is a really good explanation. And one of the things that you need to remember is that with shy dogs is you have to build their confidence in increments, as you said. You can't just say, oh, you're a great dog. Just like you can't tell a kid, you know, oh, don't be shy. You're a great kid. Everybody's going to love you. Um, You know, I have to kind of learn that in stages, and your dog does too. One of the things that they say also in The Forever Dog, which I really like, is that many of us have rescued poorly socialized dogs with some emotional baggage and erroneously assumed that a loving, stable environment will fix their mental and emotional issues. It won't, says Dr. Rodosta, who I've actually seen. She's brilliant. She's a veterinary behaviorist. When you adopt or rescue a dog that exhibits behavior issues, including fear and anxiety, all the love in the world won't fix them. You need to address the issues immediately and preferably with a team of professionals. Assemble your your behavior modification team as if you were planning your wedding, she counsels. And I think the point there is it is important to love your dog. And I get that. We, you know, because loving our dog is what motivates us to help them to change but it's not enough. You can't love something into healthiness, especially dogs who have had emotional or traumatic experiences that have caused them to be fearful or shy. It's really important that you understand that this has to be treated as an emotional issue. And emotional issues require time and patience. And it's not necessarily that anybody did anything wrong Right. Right. Just like some of us have anxiety that just kind of comes out of nowhere. We were never traumatized. We were never abused. No one was ever, you know, knowingly mean to us. We just have sensitivities. The same is true for the dogs. I will say since September 11th, I have seen a huge increase in anxiety in dogs. It's just phenomenally different before September 11th and after September 11th. And I would, I would be interested talking to psychologists, like, do we see the same thing in people that our confidence in understanding how the world works shifted in a monumental way through the trauma of that whole situation, much the way that the bombing of Pearl Harbor significantly impacted the behavior of people. 
that what we viewed as were safe empirically was suddenly not true. Right. Even though it was it was never true, we just thought it was. So I think if you have a sensitive female dog who gets bred, if you have a sensitive male dog that gets bred, if something wonky happens during the pregnancy, if she doesn't feel well during pregnancy, like all sorts of things are going to impact. And and for goodness sakes, if puppies were born at the shelter. Or a puppy mill. Or, or a pu- oh, for goodness sakes, a puppy mill. Yeah. Do we get a lot of puppy mill dogs here in Ohio? And I feel like they've got three strikes against them from the get-go. These owners get these dogs that have been raised in, let's put it this way, less than ideal situations. And the mothers have been treated as, you know, through the pregnancies in less than ideal situations. You're talking major stress all the way through pregnancy and, you know, early whelping. And it's just awful. So, you know, that's a big strike against a dog and will make it very sensitive. The other thing is, is that, you know, even innocent things can happen. I think about our Hudson, who, when he was five months old, a baby gate fell down behind him, crashed to the ground. And he was like, oh, my goodness. That, did you know that baby gates, they attack golden retrievers. They just do. And it doesn't matter how much cheese you pair with it. It's still something that one must be extraordinarily careful with. And he was that way about gates for the rest of his life. And we tried pairing it with all kinds of things. We were able to reduce his stress around gates so that he could be in the same room with a gate. And we could use one when we got another dog we needed to, you know, set up gates. But they were never something that he was going to be completely nonchalant about. And that's just part and parcel of who Hudson was. And that was just one thing. So, you know, dogs can have experiences that we don't even realize have been traumatic for them. Or like you said, they might not even have traumas. They just may be sensitive individuals. You know, I've got, um, I have nine and eight and a half grandchildren now. Um, one of which turned 13. So I now have a teenager as a grand, as a grandchild. But there are varying things to which they are sensitive, you know. One thing that will not bother Grace in the least, you know, will put Eva over the edge. Or, you know, something that doesn't bother Henry makes Robert cry. And and that's just part of the innate personalities, you know, of this is who I am and this is what I bring to the table and our dogs are the same way. So sometimes I think we spend an awful lot of time trying to figure out why my dog is some way it is. And we may never know. So why is someone afraid of a snake? Especially a non-venomous snake. Because they're icky. Like a non-venomous snake. (laughs) Like, okay, or spiders. Like, I don't know, how much does the biggest spider weigh? But we're all, most of us, are concerned about a spider or a scorpion. We all have sensitivities. We all have them. So to a certain extent, I, I don't know. There was a time that I was like, well, let's try to figure out what that came from. Sometimes we know, sometimes we don't know. It doesn't really matter how the bone got broken. Not really. Like our treatment plan is going to be based on the injury in front of us. So if we have a sensitivity, I'm just going to trust that the sensitivity is there. And, you know, the dog's not going to lay on a sofa and tell me what caused that. Sometimes we have an idea. Sometimes we have a look in. Other times we don't. And that's okay, too. Right. Right. We can still begin where the dog says it's step one. And that might mean picking up the leash. I get a lot of people who are like, the dog won't even get in the car. I'm like, right, because the car goes scary places. Smart dog, it doesn't take very long for them to go, no thanks, not going scary places, thank you. I have a great card. There's a picture of a dog sitting in the back seat. And above him is a bubble that says, Park, not vet. Park, not vet. Park, not vet. (laughs) I think that we begin to realize our dogs do know these things. And we're not tricking them. No. So what I would say is if you're on the fence, if you're like, okay, you two are just fuddy duddies. You don't know what you're talking about. Everybody in my circle tells me taking my dog to the dog park is going to improve their sociability. I want you to go to the dog park alone and watch. Yes, that's a really good advice. And then you tell me, you come back and tell us, do you think those dogs at the end of that session were behaviorally better than when they began? Or did you like the way in which they interacted? Did you think it was 
a give and take. Was it kind? Were these dogs kind to one another? Did you see dogs using a lot of self-regulation and going, you know what? I really could go for a break. I'm just going to chew on this stick. Or were you seeing dogs guarding things? Were you seeing dogs having conflict? We would not take our child to fight club. And again, I, I understand there's an awful lot of pressure on families to take their dogs everywhere, even if the dog doesn't like it or is ill-suited for it. Taking the Doberman to a brewery, he would probably think was the funniest thing in the whole wide world. I would spend my life telling him to lie down and to stop, you know, knocking over Christopher's beer. <laughs> but he is a highly social, happy dog who wants to say hello to everybody. He wouldn't be allowed to do that because then he'll put his feet on them. Because we're still learning that skill, right? But, but he's not a dog who'd be barking at other dogs. He wouldn't be tackling, you know, he, he would just be like, oh my goodness, I'm so happy I got to go out and do something fun. If I wanted to take Marco to do that, it would be awful. I'd be a nervous wreck and so would he. It'd be terrible. Mister, I would be trying to get to stop stealing everyone's food because that's that's where he would be. So until we learn to defer to the dog in front of us, we will continue to have very significant behavior problems in a lot of the population of dogs. Because when we ignore what they're telling us, because we decided that we know best, or this is what everyone says I should do, or whatever, we're then we're doing it to the dog, not with the dog. And then the dogs have to escalate. They don't have a choice. They either give up and just collapse, or they have to increase their signaling. And getting in a dog fight and getting put in the car is a great way to avoid going to the dog park. You're right. So I think that the, the takeaway here is what is it you're trying to get for, for your dog? And is the dog park really going to provide you with the best thing for your dog? And if you have a shy dog, you need to seriously ask yourself if going to the dog park and exposing it to dogs who could bully it is really going to help you achieve your goal of teaching your dog to be more comfortable in the world. So... Take a look at the dog park first. Walk around the perimeter. Watch the dogs. Spend some time studying the behaviors and ask yourself if you'd be comfortable if somebody behaved towards you that way or if you'd be comfortable with the way in which if those dogs would behave towards your dog. And pay attention to what your dog is telling you. I just remember one point we were at the dog park and Zuzu just went over to the gate and went, time to go, Mom. I'm like, okay, cool. We can do that. So, you know, your dog will tell you what it needs. So thank you, Tina, for coming back to uh, your family dog. We're happy that we're all back, and we hope that you en enjoyed your summer in our little best of series. And if you have any questions, concerns, ideas, anybody you'd like to see us on, have on as guests, let us know. You can contact us at feedback at yourfamilydogpodcast.com, and we look forward to being back and to having your family dog in your life again. Thanks for listening to Your Family Dog. Got questions? Interesting ideas? Visit www.yourfamilydogpodcast.com to share your thoughts.